Welcome back to The Great Adventure, A Journey Through the Bible. This is our seventh session. We are moving into our ninth and tenth period, our tenth and eleventh narrative books, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, and also we'll be moving into 1 Maccabees a little bit later. The colors for this period are yellow for the return, that stands for brighter days ahead as they're returning from Israel, that is, returning from exile. And then we will be moving into the Maccabean period, which is orange. And orange stands for the fire in the oil lamps in the purified temple. It's an exciting period, this, this time of returning from exile. It was predicted by the prophet Jeremiah that Israel would be, and by the way, Israel's called Israel now again. They were called Judah in the divided kingdom, but oftentimes now they're called Israel again. Even though it's only two tribes to the south, it was predicted by Jeremiah that they would be in exile for 70 years. But it was also the prophet Isaiah that predicted in Isaiah 44 and 45 that Cyrus, the king of Persia, would allow them to return. And you'll notice that Isaiah predicts this sometime before the actual return. You'll notice also a world power change from Babylon to Persia, and uh, the Persians now take over. Now, the return takes place like the exile. There were three deportations to Babylon, and there are three returns. And you can see these three returns on your Bible timeline. The first return was in 538. The second was in 525 to 457, a long span of time there. And the third return is 444. Now, three important things happened in the return. Number one, the first return, we have Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel is in the bloodline of Jesus. He's one of the kings. And he is the first to return. And what does he do? He's going to rebuild the temple. Because as you'll remember in the exile period, in 587, Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed by the Babylonians. So he's going to rebuild the temple. That's Zerubbabel. The second person to return is Ezra. He's in the second wave. And Ezra returns as a scribe to do what? But to teach. And that's important. He gets a hold of the Torah, he begins to teach the people, and he also brings some reform to the people. There is problems with mixed marriages that he has to straighten out. Because frankly, one of the problems throughout the entire story of Israel, in this story of do you trust God, has been intermarriage. Most of the problems that, that Israel finds herself in is in some way due to mixed marriage. And marriage is a covenant and so important in keeping the integrity of the people and passing the faith on to the next generation. The third person to return in the third wave was Nehemiah. And Nehemiah returns to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, 444 BC. But like any building program, you have obstacles. You have, you have um, opponents. And Israel uh, doesn't escape this. Israel is trying to rebuild the temple, rebuild the city, rebuild the walls, but she has two problems. One, a problem from within, and two, a problem from without. The problem from uh, within is that they're spending more time dealing with their own homes and their own uh, uh, soccer practices and their own hobbies and their own things rather than the church, rather than the people of God the building of the city, the building of, of the temple. And so the prophets come in at this point in this period, specifically three of them, Zechariah, Haggai, and Malachi all speak. And Haggai really brings out the point that, hey, you're spending more time on your own home than on the house of God. And Malachi the prophet brings out the point that you're robbing God during this period. How are we robbing God? By withholding the tithe. Now that's the problem from within. Now the problem from without is that the Samaritans are hindering the progress. They're, they're, they're hindering the progress of 
Israel rebuilding. And they have to say no to the Samaritans. You're not going to be a part of this. We're keeping our eyes on the Lord. We're going to go forward. So you have problems from within. You have problems without. Now, today in the church, what are we doing? We are the kingdom of God, and we, uh, we are the, the temple, the new temple. Jesus is the new temple. We're the stones being built up, and Jesus is building up his temple. But the problem that Jesus has in the New Testament is that he is rebuilding the temple, or he is the temple, and he's using living stones, as Peter calls us, living stones. And there's a problem with building with living stones, because living stones can become jealous. Living stones can become lustful. Living stones can, can doubt. Living stones can argue, gossip, all kinds of things. And so the problem that Jesus has in rebuilding the temple, this growing of the temple with living stones, is he has to deal with us. So we can learn a lesson in this return that uh, we need to be aware of internal problems to building, but also external problems to building. And the external problems lead us into the next period, which is the Maccabean Revolt. This was an incredible period in Israel's history, this Maccabean Revolt. We move to this new color on your bracelet. It's the orange color, and that stands for the fire in the oil lamps in the purified temple. Now, after the return and they built the temple, they had the law, they rebuilt the walls, things settled down for a period of time. But there is a world power shift from the Persians to the Greeks. And that's important to notice at the bottom here. We've got a world shift in, in, uh, in power. And who is the great Greek ruler? The great Greek ruler is Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great comes on the world scene. Now, after going through this whole story here, it, it might seem to you that Wow, this story is really not going anywhere. But actually, it's being set up perfectly for the Messiah. As Galatians says, in the fullness of time, he came just at the right time. But we're going to now experience the influence of the Greeks, and we're going to experience the influence of the Romans. Now, Alexander the Great, who lived from 356 to 323, was an incredible military strategist. And as the great Greek leader, his goal was to Hellenize the world. To Hellenize the world. What does that mean, to Hellenize the world? Hellenization means to make the world a Greek-speaking world, Greek customs, Greek gods. Everything in the world will be Greek. That's his goal. From the age of 13, he had an incredible tutor, an incredible teacher by the name of Aristotle from the age of 13. Okay, uh, I had Mrs. Swanson. <laughs> he had Aristotle from the age of 13 on. And so he has this incredible education, and he is a military genius. In fact, with Alexander the Great, uh, his, end, his, uh, his rule ended the Persian rule. His goal was to really take over the world. He stopped just short of India only because his troops were worn out. And Alexander the Great was the type of, of leader, military leader, where he didn't say on a walkie-talkie, go to the right, go to the left. He said, follow me. And he led them in battle. Consequently, he had many battle wounds that a lot of people are not aware of, a lot of battle wounds. And um, a lot of people don't realize uh, either that while he was a great military mind, he didn't plan for the future. And he died suddenly of a viral infection. He died at a young age with a viral infection, leaving his vast empire, which included Canaan, to his generals. And he had two major generals. He had the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. And you can see them. They are, they are on the uh, Bible timeline chart in the period of the return and the Maccabean revolt. You can see the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. He had more generals, but basically his whole empire was consolidated into these two, these two camps, the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. The Ptolemies, the rule of the Ptolemies was actually quite considerate of uh, Jewish customs. They came into the land of Canaan and they were sensitive to their, to their religious life. But in 198 BC, the Seleucids took over control and paved the way for one of the most heroic periods of Jewish history. 
Now we move in here into the book of 1 Maccabees, which is not in most Protestant Bibles. It's in the Catholic Bible. It was taken out after the Reformation. It was taken out after the Reformation. But this book of 1 Maccabees gives us continuity to the, to almost to the New Testament. And so it's important to see what's, what's happening there. And we can learn a lot of lessons from, from this period. Well, during this period also, during the, the, this, uh, this period of the, the Ptolemy's reign, another development, an important development, took place. And that was the development of the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And that Greek translation of the Old Testament took place in 250 B.C., and it was down in Egypt. If you've ever seen the letters LXX, LXX meaning, meaning 70, uh, it quickly became the Bible of all of the Jews in the diaspora outside of Jerusalem. And it becomes an important Bible for us as Catholics as we take our canon uh, ultimately from the, Sep the Septuagint. So the Septuagint was developed during this time. But what's really important for us to understand here is that once the Ptolemies' rule ended in the land of Canaan, the Seleucids moved in. And the Seleucids were tyrannical. They were led by a leader called Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes. And Antiochus Epiphanes was really quite brutal. He came down into his uh, army came down into Jerusalem, and he was going to make it his goal to Hellenize the area. And he, at first, was lenient, but then came down. Uh, he came down on them down in, um, down in Jerusalem. Now, here's what he did, and this is how it fits into the book of Maccabees. There was a family, Mattathias, the Maccabean family, that lived in a city called Modin, which is only about 17 miles northwest of Jerusalem, the city of Modin. Uh, his army was having a hard time getting people to convert over to the Greek ways, and one of the ways to do that is to use one of the stellar families as an example. So he goes to this city to do this. Now, a lot of the people started giving in to the Greek ways at this point. For example, history tells us that in the gymnasium in Jerusalem, the men, of course, are naked in the, in the gymnasium, and they carry in their bodies the signs of the covenant, circumcision. But the process of Hellenization was so effective that the Jewish men in Jerusalem, to hide the signs of the covenant, had reverse operations done. History tells us this, so that they would hide and look like the world. Now, I bring that up because that's a problem that's going on today with Christians who want to hide the marks of the covenant, of their faithfulness to God, and they can leave their church, leave, leave their home, and go to work and simply blend in. The idea is to blend in because if you blend in, you can be more successful in society. But as Mother Teresa said, God hasn't called us to be successful. He's called us to be faithful. And this is the enemy that is coming to Israel. Now, notice that beforehand here in the Maccabean Revolt, notice that when other enemies would come into Israel, they wanted Israel out. They wanted to destroy Israel. They were deported and so forth. But now we have something different that we have to take notice of, particularly as modern-day Christians. The Greeks come in, and they're saying to the Jews, oh, you can stay. You can stay. But your heart has to change. You have to change your ways because we're here now. And so that brings a crisis. Are we going to change as the people of God? Are we going to change? Are we going to allow our tradition to be taken from us so that we can live in the land and be successful? Well, Antiochus Epiphanes sent his general to Modin. Now, here's a funny thing about Antiochus. His name means God made manifest. There's a little bit of an ego there. You know, Antiochus, what's your name? I am Antiochus Epiphanes. I am God made manifest. Well, the Jews called him Antiochus Epimenes, which means madman. <laughs> so they would switch it just slightly, so they would call him madman. He comes to the city of Modin and uh, to the house of uh, the Maccabees. 
And Mattathias was chosen to be the first, and they literally, you'll find this in 1 Maccabees chapter 2, uh, he was the one uh, that was going to be made an example of first. They told him they wanted him to sacrifice to Greek gods, and Antiochus Epiphanes went into the Holy of Holies and sacrificed a pig and put a statue of a Greek god in there, comes to Modin and says, sacrifice to the Greek gods. Mattathias says, no way, no way. And another man steps forward who's probably a little scared and said, well, I will. And Mattathias goes, and that begins the Maccabean revolt. That begins the Maccabean revolt. And it was a 24-year revolt from 166 to 142 led by Judas Maccabees. And it resulted in the independence of Judah. Now they took back the temple in just a few years. And here's the interesting thing. They took back the temple in just a, couple, just a few years and they rededicated the temple after they took it back. But they didn't have enough oil left for the burning of the candles but miraculously, the candles burned for eight days during this time, and they considered it a miracle, this, this feast of dedication, they call it, the feast of lights. We call it today Hanukkah. Hanukkah is this celebration, the rededication of the temple after it's taken back from the Greeks. And I'll give you just a little teaser. Go and read the New Testament and find out what Jesus says on the Feast of Lights, the Feast of Dedication. It's interesting what he says, what he chooses to say at particular feasts. And so they end up taking back the, uh, the temple and rededicating uh, it to the Lord, but it is swept and it is clean. But here's an interesting point. We don't know where some of the furnishings are now since Babylonian exile, like the Ark of the covenant. There's no evidence that it's returned after the exile. The only one who knows where it is is Indiana Jones. <laughs> we don't know. And so it's a house that is swept and it is a house that is clean and Jesus will have something to say about that in the New Testament. Well, this, this uh, uh, revolt carries on, as I said, for about 24 years. It leads to the liberation of Judah. And then we have a relatively uh, calm period of time after that. But he here's what I want to get across to you in terms of practical application for this period. I really believe that in this, in this period we have a lesson to learn. And that is that we are the people of God. As Catholics, we're the people of God. We've been given the fullness of the Word of God, the tremendous tradition. And the world would love to come at us and say, which I think they are today, that yes, you can be Christians in America. Yeah, you can. You can be Catholics in America. But we're going to change the definition of what marriage means. We're going to change the sacraments. You can stay in the country. You can even stay in your churches. But things internally will have to change. And I, I say to that, no way. No way that we need today a modern-day, charitable, Maccabean revolt where we stand against the winds of change and say, no, we're not going to do it. And that's one of the reasons I was so happy when Pope Benedict was elected is because he's such a gentle, kind, fatherly leader, but he knows what's Catholic and what's not, and he's not going to change by, the, by uh, simply what the winds are telling us to, to do in, in our time. Now, there's a, a number of other developments during this time, right before we come to the time of the Messiah and the, uh, the time of the church. For example, uh, Judaism is changing. While they've been in exile, the party of the Pharisees has grown considerably. Away from the temple now, we have the Pharisees who are teachers of the law. They are growing and they're, they're growing in, pop, in popularity. Also, when the temple was destroyed and they were in exile, the kitchen table became very important as like an altar. And so the laws of eating became very important, the kosher laws during, during, this, uh, during this, this time. The synagogue was developed during this time 
when the temple was destroyed. When they started meeting in the synagogue and teaching the word, the Pharisees' role became very important. Now, you'll notice in the, in the timeline here that we had the Greeks as the world power. Now, during this period here, the, the Maccabean Revolt, of course, they liberated themselves from uh, Greek, the Greek Empire, but the Romans come in now as the world power. And they will rule all the way through Christ here as the world rulers. But there's two things that are kind of interesting with the Greeks and the Romans. While, you know, remember the story with Joseph? When Joseph finally, back in the, in the book of Genesis, a long time ago, several sessions ago, when he uh, announced to his brothers, it's me, Joseph, they were afraid that, that uh, he was going to kill him. And he said, look, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. I was sent before you to prepare the way. Well, in some ways, too, God uses the Greeks and the Romans for the benefit of the gospel. What do I mean? Well, the Greeks are responsible for this, this language that goes throughout the world. They were pushing this language on everyone. Everyone seems to know Greek. And so it, it, it's really a preparation for a worldwide language for this explosion of the new kingdom that's going to take place very shortly. The second thing is the Roman roads. The Roman roads. The Romans were known for building their roads, and they construct their roads during this time. So we have sort of uh, an, ancient, um, an ancient internet developed 